ladies and gentlemen. There you go. A very formal welcome to DPP, a.k.a. Daily Power Parsha. Today is Thursday, September 9th. Very special day because, why is it special? First of all, because it's the day that we have today. But it's also special because it is the first non-holiday day in 5782. So we had two days of Rosh Hashanah, and now we have day three of Tishrei, which is kind of day one of non-holiday days. And so welcome to 5782. Hope the, hope the year is treating you well, and please God, it should continue to go smoothly. And if it hasn't, I'm sorry, but it should get smooth right away and only be smooth. Today is also fast day. Just so you know, it's called Som Gedalia. You can look it up as to what Som means fast. It's the fast of Gedalia. You can look it up. He was a, a Jewish uh, um, leader who was assassinated on this day. Actually, not on this day, on Rosh Hashanah, but it's pushed off because you can't fast on the holiday to this day. So it's a fast. It's not one of the major fasts. It's a minor fast. Um, nonetheless, it is a fast day, which always evokes the question, why do fast days go so slow? Back to our Torah reading. It's Vayelech. Let me pull it up for y'all. And today is Thursday, which means we're up to the fifth reading. The good news is the whole portion is 37 verses, which means, although we have to catch up, it's not that much to catch up. So let's jump in. Vayelech is still the last day of Moses' life. And the Torah tells us, we're going to go through, so starting with the first reading, two, three, four, five. Let's go. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number one. And the Torah portion op opens up, Vayelech, hence the name Vayelech. Vayelech means, and he went. Vayelech, Moshe, and Moses went. And he spoke the following words to all Israel. And our sages tell us, even on the last day of his life, he was moving and shaking. Moses is going, he's, he's moving around, he's active. To the very end, this is the blessing that we all ask, we all hope for, that to the very end, we should be active and we should have, you know, our faculties, etc. And uh, we should be strong to the end. It says, Vayelech Moshe, Moses went. Um, yeah, he was moving and shaking. And this is what he said. He said to them, he said to the people, today, last day of his life, I am 120 years old. That tells us that he passed away on his birthday. He said, today, I'm 120. You know what that means? Happy birthday to Moshe, right? That was his birthday. I can no longer go or come. Oh, now that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction. It says Moses went. What does it mean I can no longer go or come? Uh, what it means is that he can no longer take the people cross rivers, right, into the promised land. And the Lord said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan, right? I can no longer go or come really means I, can't, I can no longer take you as a leader, past this point where we are right now, because God said, because God told me, you shall not cross this Jordan. But as he said dozens of times in this fifth book of the Torah, don't worry, the Lord your God, he will cross before you. In other words, as you cross the Jordan, who goes with you? Not just Joshua, but God Almighty. He will destroy these nations from before you so that you will possess them. Joshua, he will cross before you as the Lord has spoken. This is the opening reading. Moses, once again, reassuring the Jewish people that all will be good, even though he won't be with them because he can no longer move forward because God has told him this is the end of the line. Again, powerful. Last day of his life. And what's he thinking about? Jewish people. You would think last day of his life. All right, let me think about myself. He's the consummate leader. He's the ultimate leader. The last day of his life. And what's he involved with? His people. It's a very special thing. I'm sure I don't have to elaborate on that. I mean, just think about what people do on the last day of their lives. It's typically not an in-service of community thing, even if they were a leader. It's typically not. Are you guys with me on this? Yeah. It's typically not out. It's, it's inward. Moses is different. That's why he's the ultimate leader. Reading number two. And the Lord, you see these are short readings. And the Lord will do, to, Moses continues, and the Lord will do to them, them meaning the nations that you will encounter across the Jordan, the Lord will do to them as he did 
to the Amorite kings, Sichon and Og, and to their land, all of which he destroyed. In other words, we just recently, not that long ago, a few months ago, um, in the times of Moses, they encountered these other nations, Sichon and Og, these other kings, Sichon and Og, and the Jewish people destroyed them, were victorious over them. So Moses says, you will be victorious there like we have been victorious on this side of the Jordan. And when the Lord delivers them before you, verse 5, you shall do to them according to all the commandment that I have commanded you. In other words, all the stuff that we've talked about these last 37 days, don't forget what you're supposed to do. Number 6, verse 6, chazak, sorry, chizku ve'imtsu. We say today, we wish people chazak ve'ematz. That's the singular. The, plur the, the, um, the plural is chizku ve'imtsu. Y'all be strong and y'all be courageous. Chazak v'amatz means you individually, you be strong and courageous. We say that to uh, somebody, you know, bar mitzvah boy, chazak v'amatz, be strong and courageous. Moses tells the people, chizku v'imtsu, be strong and courageous, neither fear nor be dismayed of them, of the other nations that you will encounter. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will neither fail you nor forsake you. You have nothing to worry about. Powerful words of encouragement. Be strong and courageous. There's not much Rashi because there, it's, it's pretty much narrative driven. Rashi just gives us um, this quick insight over here in this reading. That's the expression here means God will not give you cause for weakness resulting from your being forsaken by him. In other words, God is not going to let you go so that you're vulnerable. It's not going to happen. God is not going to let you go. You're not going to be vulnerable. You're with God, God is with you. You have, not, you have nothing to worry about. It's kind of like skydiving. Yeah, Sky, has anyone been skydiving? Raise your hand, skydiving. No skydivers? No? Okay. Um, what, sorry? My kids did. Oh, you're killed. perfect, perfect. In your that uh, thing, no, not the real thing. Oh, the at, at the, uh, I've been there also at the uh, iFly, at the iFly, uh, the indoor, the indoor sky, yeah, the indoor skydiving. I've been there. It's an it's a, it's a crazy experience. But real, like traditional skydiving is, you know, jump out of a plane or a helicopter and you do your thing. You're typically, you're going to be, if you're a novice, you're just not, you're not going to just go skydiving. You're going to go with an instructor who is strapped to you, right? And you might see someone in that little plane who is about to step out into the thing and they're petrified. Is that possible that that might happen at the last second, get again in cold feet? Yeah. Yes. It's like reminds you of the joke with the guy, the Israeli paratrooper. Uh, he goes to this training, all this training. He gets up in the helicopter and they're about to they're playing. They're about to do the jump. And uh, he refused the jump. He said, what, what's going on? He said, I'm too scared. So why did you join the paratroopers? I wanted to be around courageous people. You know, I wanted to hang out with people who are, who, have, who are brave. All right, anyway, but imagine like somebody gets cold feet and you tell them, look, I know you're nervous. I know you're wanting to back out now, but don't worry, you're strapped to the instructor. You're strapped to the expert. You're not going anywhere. You're in good hands with Allstate, not sponsored by Allstate, nonetheless. You're in good hands. You'll be taken care of. This is what Moses says to the Jewish people. You're not being pushed out in a free fall, you know, without a, without a thing. What's that? A uh, parachute, right? And without a court, you, you've got it. Not only do you have a parachute, God's with you. You have the expert instructor. You have the, um, you have God with you. Nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. Don't be afraid. All right, let's get back inside. Reading number three. Okay. Again, parting words. Very powerful. And Moses called Joshua, verse 7. After he speaks to the people, Moses calls over Joshua and said to him, in the presence of all Israel. So they're up there, I imagine, like a platform or something. And Moses calls Joshua. They're side by side. And he says to Joshua, in the singular now, as I mentioned before, be strong and courageous. For you shall come with this people to the land which the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them and you shall apportion it to them as an inheritance. Moses says, my friend Joshua, you're going to need some strength and courage. <laughs> you're going to need this blessing. The people need to also be strong and courageous, but you, you're the one that's guiding them. I mean, God, of course, but you're the one that's going to be the leader. Chazank ve'emat, be strong and courageous, and uh, lead them to the promised land. 
and give them the land as uh, as an inheritance. Let's continue verse number eight. The Lord, he is the one who goes before you. So Moses reminds, jo this is all to Joshua in front of everybody. Everyone's listening, but he says to Joshua, don't, don't make this all about you and don't shoulder the burden by yourself. In other words, the weight of the nation is not on your shoulders because God is involved. The Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor forsake you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. This is what Moses tells Joshua now, similar message to the people. He tells the people, don't worry, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, don't, don't, don't be fearful of the nations. God is with you. He tells Joshua, hey, you also don't be afraid. Joshua might have a different fear, not about the nations, but about the people vis-a-vis -vis the nations. It's like, how am I going to manage all this stuff? Don't worry, God is helping you as well, not just them. God is going to help you. Then what happens next? Now, oh, I have to explain. The narrator comes back in. Remember the narrator was gone for most of Deuteronomy? It was just Moses speaking the first person. Now we have a narrator that tells us in verse 9 that then Moses wrote this Torah. It, Moses doesn't say, and so I will write a Torah. No. God doesn't say, Moses write a Torah. The narrator is saying, then Moses wrote this Torah. What's this Torah? This Torah. He wrote a Torah and gave it to the priests. He's a quick writer. That's a, it's a long book. Anyway, he wrote the Torah and gave it to the priests, to the Kohanim, the descendants of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and all, and to all the elders of Israel. Let's take a look at Rashi here. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. Okay, first of all, you shall come with his people. Rashi says the word S means with. So Rashi gives a bit of a twist. Let's look at this Rashi. Accordingly, Moses' statement of leadership role to Joshua can be understood as false. Moses said to Joshua, the elders of the generation will be with you for everything should be done according to their opinion and counsel. What's interesting is that Moses tells Joshua, you should lead, but with some consensus, have a board. Can we call it a board? That's probably a better word for it. Advisory committee, <laughs> have a, uh, a council of elders. Oh, that's perfect. Council of elders, I think we nailed the terminology there. Council of elders that you shall consult with when you have questions. That's what Moses tells Joshua. However, God gives different advice. In contrast, however, the Holy One blessed be said to Joshua, for you shall bring the children of Israel to the land which I have sworn to them, verse 23. God's statement of leadership wrote to, jo God's statement of leadership wrote to Joshua here means you shall bring them even if it is against their will. Everything depends upon you only, only upon you, if necessary, you must take a rod and beat them over their heads. Okay, not literally. There can only be one leader for a generation, not two leaders for a generation. Interestingly enough, Moses advocates leadership by consensus, and God gives Joshua the advice to lead with strength. Are you with me on this? You might think it's the other way around, that Moses, as the previously would have said, oh, these people, you got you to gotta be strong. And God would have said, no, consensus, kumbaya, that sort of thing. But here, here the roles reverse a little bit. Moses, who knows what it's like to try to rule with an iron fist and try to you know, do this by himself, he says the best thing is get, get, out, get a council of elders, try to get consensus and you know, group decisions, that sort of thing. And God said, but don't, don't forget, you are the ruler, and ultimately what you say goes. The truth is, What's the ideal model of leadership? You know the answer. You know what I'm going to say. Both. You need to both have consensus and be prepared to, to chart the course yourself if others are unwilling or unable to, uh, to lead together with you. The Rebbe has a, has a beautiful sikha, a beautiful talk um, and exposition on this Rashi and on this teaching, but we'll save that for another time. He does a deep dive into this. But in general, the, I'm giving you the, the, the cliff notes or the spark notes or whatever on this is um, a, a good leader has both qualities, the ability to build consensus, but also when needed, the ability to forge ahead alone. And that need not be a political conversation, but we know that in leadership, it takes both forms. If a leader only does everything by consensus, 
then there's going to be a limitation. If they only do things my way, the highway, you're going to lose everybody. So you really need a balance of both. Are you with me on this? It's true in relationships. It's true in parenting. It's true in educating. It's true in everything, right? Okay, let's jump back in. Oh, if you're the CEO of a company, yeah, you probably also want this. You need buy-in. You need advice. You also need to set the agenda. You know that I'm just thinking now of a, of a, 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 a what's her name? Um, Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes. Her trial just started yesterday or something. Yeah, like two days ago, yesterday, two days ago. Anyway, very interesting case. Very interesting case. The, the, what's, what's at stake is the question of responsibility of a leader. It's kind of, I don't want to minimize the, I don't want to like, you know, shrink the case too much. You know, her claim is, my understanding is, her claim is, look, we tried, we failed. Or the funding got pulled before we could achieve. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for another analysis. We'll She's also that. blaming her boyfriend. Yeah, 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 yeah. For uh, hoodwinking her into, yeah, exactly. All right, fine. We'll, uh, we'll leave that for another, another time, another conversation. Oh, it got me thinking. Oh, I also saw, oh, I'm going to give you guys breaking news. I saw, anybody familiar with the Matrix uh, trilogy? The movie trilogy? You know, they're coming out with a fourth movie now. Did you guys see that? Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, whatever her name is. You know, you know about this stuff? Um, um, the Matrix? Yes. Yeah, I know the Matrix. Yeah. The green stuff. Yeah, they're having the, the new film coming out December 22nd. is called The Matrix, The Resurrection or Resurrections or something like that. Anyway, so I've been, I, I literally thought of this when the first Matrix came out. It must have been, I think, maybe late 90s, 99 or something or 2000. One of those uh, like 20 years ago, 20 some years ago. I always wanted to do a Kabbalah of the Matrix. And I decided this morning when I saw that there was a new trailer for the film, I'm like, we're doing it. So it's going to be right around the movie launch because why not capitalize on the buzz? And why not? We'll do a, a Kabbalah of the Matrix, three parts on the essence of reality from a Jewish perspective. We know the movie version. I think the screenwriters are Jewish. Is this true? Is that confirmed? I believe so. I could be wrong, though. It's two screenwriters, siblings, I believe. Anyway, um, so we're going to do the Kabbalah of the Matrix. Stay tuned for more information, either December or January, one of those two months. Back to our story, back to Vayelach. So Moses writes the Torah, and he gives it to the Kohanim. Rashi says, last Rashi on this uh, reading, when it was entirely completed, Moses gave it to the members of his tribe, Levi. And the verse here, Rashi says, is referring to the entire Torah as we know it. Not just like that portion. When it says he wrote the Torah, what Torah did he write? The whole shebang. I know what you're wondering. How could he have possibly written the Torah so quickly? I don't have the answer. But he wrote the Torah. Maybe he started and he finished it. I don't know. I'm sure it's discussed. I don't have the answer. Let's jump in, at least right now. Fourth reading, Vayelech, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number 10. Then Moses commanded them, the Jewish people, saying the following. At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time, in the festival of Sukkot, after the year of Shemitah. How appropriate. Look at that. Unbelievable. Such nice timing. This is not referring to the sabbatical year that we're starting, but the year following the sabbatical year. So imagine, this year is a sabbatical year. It starts Rosh Hashanah. It ends next Rosh Hashanah. So imagine the Sukkot following the sabbatical year. So not this Sukkot, like in a week and a half, but next year Sukkot. Are you with me on this? That would be the Sukkot that followed the sabbatical year. This year will be the sabbatical year. Next Sukkot will be the Sukkot at the end of the sabbatical year. So what happens is there should be a national gathering. All the people should gather, men, women, and children should gather in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount 
for a big ceremony and celebration every seven years following the sabbatical year on the holiday of Sukkot. That mitzvah is called hakel. Hakel means gathering. And that's what we're talking about right now. Let's read it inside. So again, let's start from the quote. Moses says to the people at the end of every seven years, at an appointed time in the festival of Sukkot, after the year of release, after the Shemitah year, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place he will choose, Jerusalem, you shall read this Torah before all Israel in their ears. Hakel Esa'am, assemble the people. Hakel, that's what it's called. That's the mitzvah. By the way, this is mitzvah out of 613. This is mitzvah number 612. This is the second to last mitzvah in the Torah is the mitzvah of Hakel gathering the entire nation, the men, the women, and the children, and your stranger in your cities. Everyone should gather in Jerusalem in order that they hear and in order that they learn and fear the Lord your God, and they will observe to do all the words of this Torah. It's interesting. Oh, and their children who do not know, how, what's the point of bringing the kids? They're not going to be able to understand the Torah. They will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God all the days that you live in the land to which you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So in other words, the children will not necessarily understand the exact messages of the Torah because they're too young like babies, right? They can't understand that, toddlers. But they can be impressed with the sight of the entire nation gathering together as one men women, children, and the king, the Jewish king, would read the Torah on the Temple Mount to all the assembled. This was the most incredible sight. Can you imagine the entire nation gathering once every seven years? And our sages say, the commentaries say, you know what this, this was like? This was like almost not exactly a reenactment, but it was akin, it was similar to Sinai. When all the people gathered at the mountain to hear the word of God, this is also all, everyone gathering at the, at, at the Temple Mount, at a mountain, to hear the word of God in the Torah being read by the, by the king. It was about unity. It was about awesomeness. It was like an awesome experience. It was awe-inspiring. It was joyous. It had everything. And the kids had to be there. Why? Because it's the experience, right? It's the experience. It's like the World Fair, right? It's like the World Fair. You go to the World Fair as a kid, you remember it. What exactly happened? Who knows? I went to the World Fair. I went to Hakel. I had that experience. What exactly was said? I don't know, but I was at Hakel. I was at that experience, right? It's kind of like the Woodstock, right? They say Woodstock. If you remember it, you weren't there. Anyway, that's, an, oh, that's another, that's another uh, teaching. Yeah, Joy. <laughs> but yesterday you talked about the mitzvah of listening, of hearing. Yes. I guess that was prepping everybody because they were about to be read to. Yes, yes. And here it's a, right, exactly. It's, it's, it's listening. The blessing on the shofar is l'shma koshover, to listen to the sound of the shofar. It's not just to make the sound. Making the sound is one thing, but listening and really taking in active listening is, the, is a powerful blessing for us all. We're always supposed to listen, but every seven years, there was this national spectacle. And by the way, there was a mitzvah, every pilgrimage festival, Sukkot, Passover, Shavuot, three times a year, those that could were supposed to go to the temple and Jerusalem and the temple for the holiday. But not everybody was, not women and children. The men were obligated, you know, if they could make it, they were obligated. Women and children were not obligated. They wanted to, they could go, but they weren't obligated. But Hakel, once every seven years, mandatory. Everyone had to be there. And it was like Sinai. I mean, again, not literally Sinai, but it was the closest type of experience along the lines of Sinai that's in Jewish, that's in Jewish practice. The Rebbe said um, some decades ago that we should bring, bring back Hakel. Not, not literally Jerusalem, Temple Mount, whatever, but the, every, the year after the um, sabbatical year, so this year is the sabbatical year, the year after should, all, should be a year of Jewish unity. And so the Rebbe had campaigns. 
multiple times on that year of like things that would bring people together throughout the year. Gatherings and programs and mitzvah campaigns that would, with the express purpose that this is, I, I mean, you call it year eight or year one of the new cycle, whatever. It's the year after the seven year sabbaticals, the, the sabbatical year. So it's about focusing on the idea of unity and togetherness. So it's something we still have a year to figure this out, but please God, next year we'll have in place some really cool things for this purpose of, of Hackle. Yeah. So I'm still a little confused. So, you know, we can't do half the mitzvahs because they're related. We would have to have a temple. Israel and the temple. Yes. Exactly. So the state of Israel is not that Israel. Correct. Correct. So why, why do they, do they still do the Shemitah in Israel? Agricultural? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Some mitzvot are dependent on a temple, like right. the sacrificial oh. stuff for sure. But some are only dependent on living in Israel. Oh. Some are dependent on the majority of world Jewry living in Israel and sovereignty. That's, but Shemitah is not like that. Shemitah is very specific. It's a land, it's not on the person, it's on the land. Does that make sense? Yes. So we still Israel, the state of Israel is recognized as our Israel. Oh, for like, sure. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that the lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This would require a bigger deep dive into like how Halacha views the state of Israel. That's for another okay. conversation. But whether you call it the state of Israel or the land of Israel, the bottom line is the land is holy land. It's the holy, it's the holy okay. land. And therefore the Shemitah, when it comes to a mitzvah, some are gavra, some are hefza, some are on the person, and some are on the thing that it should be done. Does that make sense? Like some, is the mitzvah, I'll give you an example. Is the mitzvah that one should light Shabbat candles, or is the mitzvah that Shabbat candles should be lit? And since you need someone to light it, so you light it, but the main mitzvah is that it should be lit. Huh. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to answer regarding Shabbat candles, but some mitzvot are gavra, the person. It's you should do it. And some are the chavza, it should be done, but of course it needs human involvement to be done. So either way, it involves both parties. The question is, what's the primary? By the way, what I'm giving you now is what we call a chakira, not shakira, that's someone else. A chakira is, no, sure. chakira is a, a, a Jewish Talmudic terminology for something that could be viewed one of two ways. And depending on how you view it, oh, it has all sorts of ramifications in halacha, for example. Is Shemitah gavra or chefza? Is the sabbatical year about you or about the land? If it's about you, well, then maybe it's only about if the majority of you live in Israel with a temple, blah, blah, blah. But if it's about the land, the land is the land. Shemitah is clearly about the chefza, about the land. Shemitah is about, sabbatical is about the land. Therefore, Yes, temple, no temple, Jewish... The Holy temple. Land, Israel's Holy it's Land. It's the yeah. land. It's about the land. The land should not be worked. Done. Now, you should not work the land because human beings typically work the land. But it's not about you. It's about the land. So therefore, even if the majority of Jews don't live in Israel, even if there's no temple, even if there's no Jewish king, there's not the Messianic... It doesn't make a difference. Shemitah, Shemitah. But, but a lot of the mitzvot, as you accurately pointed out, cannot be fulfilled in the literal sense because we're miss because it's on the person and or on the nationhood and we're missing those elements. So for example, this mitzvah number 612 out of 613, I feel like it's an art print, right? 612 out of 613. So number 612 is about gathering. That mitzvah is not in effect today. We don't have a temple, we don't have a king, we don't have, that's a lot of things that are missing. Yet the Rebbe in trying to kind of, you know, um, eternalize the mitzvot, and here it does get a little bit literal. The Rebbe said, I mean, figuratively literal, or literally figurative, the Rebbe said we should, it should be a year of unity. Not necessarily pilgrimage to one place and whatever, but the theme should be unity. So the year after the Shemitah year should be a year of unity. But anyway, this is where the mitzvah comes from. This is where the mitzvah is found. It's a beautiful, beautiful mitzvah. And I think to me, it's the kids like that's what really evokes the sense that it's bigger than any specific message. It's like an experience of just togetherness that transcends any particular messaging that could be said. 
It's not about, oh, you know what I heard at that high? I heard something amazing. It's not what you're hearing as much as what you're experiencing. It's like a concert. It's, is it about the music? Yeah, but you could also listen to the music, you know, the recordings. It, it, the concert is about the experience, it's the ambiance, it's the connection between people and between the performers, etc. At least as a non-regular concert goer, that's my belief of what a concert ought to be or is. All right, let's continue with reading number five and let's catch up for today. Um, so we have Hakel. Now, reading five. And the Lord said to Moses, again, we're back to third party narrator. It's no longer Moses speaking. It's now we're learning what happened on this last day of the life of Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, your days are approaching for you to die. Uh, yeah, that's an understatement. Today is literally the last day. Call Joshua, God says, call Joshua, get him on the phone. No, call Joshua and stand in the tent of meeting and I will inspire him. So Moses and Joshua went and stood in the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting was, oh, I always go back to that picture that Donna shared. It's like the picture of the building, the temple, the, the tabernacle building with the cover. There's like the outdoor area, the open, open air, open sky. But then there's like the inner building that had the menorah, the, the inner altar, the showbread table. And then there was an innermost chamber that had the ark. Anyway, in that building is where they were told to go. So here they are, Moses and Joshua standing in that covered I mean, that's why it's called the tent of meeting. It was covered. Um, and the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud. That's got to be heavy. Uh, I mean, you know, metaphorically heavy. The pillar of cloud stood at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, you are about to lie with your forefathers. Lie with your forefathers means return to the earth. It means pass away and be laid to rest. And this nation will rise up and, oh, look at this. Wow. Before it was Moses telling the people, you know, that unfortunately what might happen. Now God is predicting. And this nation will rise up and stray after the deities of the nations of the land into which they are coming. God is telling Moses, in case you were planning on dying peacefully, you should know the story will not, will not, will not end well. And they will forsake me and violate my covenant, which I made with them. And God says, my fury will rage against them on that day. And I will abandon them and hide my face from them. And they will be consumed. And many evils and troubles will befall them. And they will say on that day, is it not because our God is no longer in my midst that these evils have befallen me? And I will hide my face on that day because of all the evil they have committed when they turned to other deities. This is God telling Moses and Joshua, a warning of what would happen if the people will stray. And it's, it, it seems almost like a prophecy prediction, not that God prophecies, um, a prophet prophecies, but a God, God just says it the way it is because God's not limited by time. This is going to happen. They're going to stray. But we know that the good news is the end of the story is that we're still here and we will come back. We've come back. We'll come back. That's the great comeback story. But here God is basically saying it's for a time, at some point in time, for a time, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be nice. It's, it's going to be a little bit tricky. And now, he says, write for yourselves this song and teach it to the children of Israel. Place it into their mouths in order that this song will be for me as a witness for the children of Israel. God says, write this song. This song refers to the next Torah portion, next week's Torah portion called Ha'azinu. It's a song. It's poetry. It's a, it's written in in in, uh, in like poetry. Even in the Torah, it's written in stanzas like poetry, different columns and whatnot. Um, is it written in two or three? Song by the seas. One of them is written in two columns. One is one of them is written like one, two. Like right, left, center, right, left, center, right, like different, like short snippets of text. I forget which one is which. Okay, it'll come to me at some point. Bottom line is, God says to Moses, write this song, this song referring to next week's Torah portion, which once again is a poetic version of the arc of history. Good 
to not good to good again. Right? We did that last week, right? Good, Israel, we got it. We got the promised land, riding high, conquered the land, settled it, all's good. Blessings galore, straying from God, kicked out of the land, evicted, exiled, diaspora, returning to God, reconnecting, in gathering the exiles, Mashiach, and eternal good, eternal goodness. That's the ark. Moses said it to the people, and God says to Moses and Joshua, this again, this is on the radar at some point. It's going to happen. You got to tell the people one more time in the form of a song this time to, uh, to prepare them for what's going on and to warn them, to try to maybe keep, maybe keep them away from this. Um, in general, a bad prophecy could be averted. Good prophecy typically will come true, will come to pass, but a bad prophecy could be averted. So could this have been averted? Sure. Was it averted? No. We're in exile right now, and this is what's going on. This was all predicted. Um, but anyway, but there, the good news is there's an upside. There's there's a third act that we're uh, hopefully in the process of. Okay, now, okay, that's it. That's it. That's it. For, I feel like we ended on a little bit of a negative note, but that's the way the fifth reading ends. Um, sixth reading and seventh reading we'll do tomorrow. And yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. By the way, this this um, last verse write for yourselves this song according to our sages is I mean the literal meaning I told you is write the next Torah portion as a song and that's the warning and another form of you know the arc of history of Jewish history, but it also refers to the midst of writing a Torah scroll, the midst of writing a safer Torah. Write for yourselves the song is mitzvah number 613. The final mitzvah of the Torah is to write a scroll. Everybody should be involved in writing a Torah scroll. It's a very special mitzvah. Either write it yourself or you, be, you participate in the writing of a scroll. That was another campaign that the Rebbe was very strongly promoting to, to, uh, to write a Torah scroll. Um, children, the Rebbe said, every child when they're born or when they're very young, the parents should buy a letter for them in a Torah scroll that's being written for children. And there are multiple opportunities to do that. Um, you can participate in, in Torah scrolls, typically with a dollar, just pay a dollar and you get one letter in the Torah scroll and uh, easy way to participate in the mitzvah as well as communal opportunities. At some point, again, all breaking news. This is where DPP, I mean, not, not everyone knows this. You guys know this. DPP is where all, all the breaking news happens. At some point, please God, my intention is to do a, an IJA Torah scroll campaign. So at some point, we'll do something like that. Um, that's, that's at least my intention. So we will have the opportunity to do that. Maybe even, you know, if you, if you dedicate a certain section of the Torah, you know, we could study together, whatever. We'll have to figure out exactly what that looks like. Bottom line is, this is Mitzvah 613. The final Mitzvah of the Torah is to write another scroll. It's to keep it moving forward, to to internalize it and perpetuate it for the next generation, for ourselves and for those that come after us to write a new scroll. So here we have the last two minutes of the Torah today, Hakel gathering and writing a Torah scroll. More on that tomorrow, but let's close it out on a positive note as we begin a new year. It's interesting, like as one new chapter begins, another one ends, right? As we begin a new year, we're in the, we're in the final moments of the life of Moses. But even in his final moments, we see a dedication to his people, dedication to the art and the craft of leadership. And it's not a, it's not a game. It's, he's literally concerned and cares 24-7. He lives, breathes Torah and the Jewish people. That's, that's his dedication. Halavai, we should be dedicated to something like Moses was dedicated to us and hopefully something positive like Moses was dedicated to us. Um, okay, so may this year be a year of Torah study a year of unity, a year of letting go and letting God, and a year of blessings for us all. Um, we're back on tomorrow. We're, we're, we're on tomorrow, please God, 12 o'clock, same bad time, same bad channel for DPP. We'll do readings six and seven and wrap up the, uh, the Torah portion. Okay, any final questions, comments before we close out? Is there still more to the Torah before it ends? Yeah, there's Hazinu, the song that 
mm -hmm. we just referenced a moment ago. Um, and then Vizot HaBracha, the final portion. There's a final, okay. There's two not, not this week, it's another. Yeah, there's two more after this week. So this is Vayelach, then there's Hazinu, and Vizot HaBracha, there's two more after this. Two more portions. Two more or, portions, yeah. So that's not much. No, we're, <laughs> we're, we're near the end. We're right. near the end. If you, if you looked at the Torah scroll as it's scrolled, I mean, it's you could you know, remember those cassette tapes? You're like you're you can tell when you're near the end. There's a lot, there's a lot of stuff around one of the things and a very little amount on the other side. What so there's a couple of weeks where there's really we don't read Torah portion, right? Daily so, Torah. No, no, this week was Vayelech. Next week is um next week is Hazinu. And then we have Sukkot. And then during Sukkot, on that Shabbat of Sukkot, we don't read a Vizot Bracha, we read it on, on Simcha Torah. The last day of Sukkot. And then we start Bereshit right then. That's the plan. And we have a special party. Okay. All <laughs> right. We'll see you guys. Have a wonderful day. I have a question Thank about the, the Thank long. you, Rabbi. Pleasure. Uh, pleasure. I yeah. think, uh, I don't know if it's related to the Shemitah or, but when you, you know, you gave a loan to someone, so you have to, you, it's not yours. Correct. Part uh, of the part of the shmita is that the loans also take a take a rest. The mm -hmm. loans are also released automatically. Yeah, unless so, you give it over to the bet din with the prusbal, you could say a thing and you would fill out a form, and that way you can still collect on that. Okay, so yeah, that was my question. Is it a bit like the hametz? Like, there's yeah, always a loophole. The rabbi. Oh yes, there is a loophole. Okay. Yes. There's a, there's a declaration that could be said, but also an online form. Just look up this. I'm going to type it in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's P-R-U-Z. And this is not just yeah. about living in Israel. Is no, it's everywhere. This, no, this is everywhere. Yeah. Cruise ball. Look that up. Cruise ball. Okay. It's like Super ball, but totally different. Cruise Completely ball. different. No <laughs> relation. Cruise ball. Yeah. All right. We'll see you guys. Have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure.